Hello once again, everybody. Thank you for joining me here on this Wednesday, November 18th edition of ATS Radio. I'm your host, Adam Burke. I'll be joined today by professional better and handicapper Kyle Hunter from huntersportspicks.com. We'll probably spend 75% of the show on college football today, 25% on college basketball, which is supposed to start a week from today. We'll see if that actually ends up happening, but fingers crossed we will have some hoops to talk about over the next several weeks here on the college hardwood over at ATS.io, we'll be covering college basketball it, to whatever degree it happens. We're doing picks and predictions for college football and the NFL. Some announcements today that Points Bet Sportsbook now up and running in Colorado, including some Colorado specific promotions. So if you listen to the show in Colorado or one of the neighboring states, that's certainly of interest to you. Check out those two articles over at ATS.io. And while you're there, download the ATS app, which you can get for the Google Play Store or the Apple Store, so for Android or iOS devices, or for issue, you can download that right on your smartphone. It's a bet tracker, an odd screen, stats, trends, information, article integration from ATS.io. Lots of great stuff in that app. We very much encourage you to check that one out. And lastly, a good promotion over at BetMGM Sportsbook for the Thursday night football game between the Arizona Cardinals and the Seattle Seahawks. A new user promotion at BetMGM Bet $1 on the money line, win $100 in free bets for any touchdown scored in that game with a high total, two dynamic offenses, two bad defenses, a touchdown will be scored. So over at BetMGM, use that new user offer to bet $1, win $100 in free bets on that Thursday night NFL matchup. With that, we bring in professional better and handicapper Kyle Hunter from huntersportspicks.com. And Kyle, how's it going today, man? Doing well. How about yourself, Adam? Doing well, buddy. Appreciate your time as always here, sir. And, uh, you know, already getting some cancellations here for this week in college football. That was inevitable with the spikes around the country. Hopefully we don't get to 15 like we had last week. But, you know, with COVID spiking, with these games getting canceled, I know you were working on a write-up for Wake Forest and Duke last night and that game getting canceled as you're doing the write-up. Are you more hesitant to bet early on in the week now than you were maybe two, three, four weeks ago, or are you still you know, trying to get that line value wherever you can? Um, I'm a little bit more hesitant, especially on sides. Totals I try to take early because I think I'll, I'll get the line value. Now, lately I've been getting a lot of line value and then losing, like I said to you before, before we started airing here. But, um, you know, it's not been a great run for me of late, and I'm always honest about that. Uh, I do think it will turn around in time. If you keep getting that CLV, it's a, it's a good sign. But it is a little bit hard to uh, bet too many games early on because even with totals, you don't know who's going to be out that it could hurt quite a bit with an over or you know even with an under if it's a defensive player. So I've been a little bit more cautious this year, played a, a little bit less games, and um, you know I think that'll probably continue as well. Yeah, and of course, you know something we talked about with Brad Powers on last week's show. Maybe, you know, these college campus spikes that we're sort of seeing, maybe those kind of slow down a little bit after the Thanksgiving holiday with a lot of colleges and universities going remote after the Thanksgiving break to finish up the semester and all of that, or some of them even doing finals right before Thanksgiving and then being done. So we'll see if college football can navigate these uh, rough seas here throughout the rest of 2020. With that, some teams that were trying to navigate some rough seas last week in their games. We'll talk about some box score notes. We'll talk about some regression candidates. And we'll talk about some tempo changes before we get to a few games. And then, as I mentioned in the intro, talk a little bit of college basketball to finish up today's show. But you and I had a lot of overlap with some of the box score notes that we picked up on here uh, coming out of Week 11, heading into Week 12. I'll let you start with some teams that you know offensively had some pretty good weekends. Yeah, Notre Dame 7.6 yards per play in a tough spot last week against Boston College. I had Boston College as my free play. Didn't get the very best of the number. I know 14 wasn't there very long. It was there very briefly, but um, lost that free pick there last Saturday. You know, I think the Notre Dame offense looks like they're getting better here. Early in the season, Ian Book didn't look very good. The passing game wasn't working. Notre Dame's been quite a bit better here of late. The other one that I'll kind of throw in with it, Oregon with 8.8 yards per play and a win over Washington State. I will say that was one of my losses was the under in that game. Oregon's defense has been a lot worse than I expected them to be. Oregon's offense has been better than I expected them to be. 
And I do think that, as we said last week, Jaden Delora for Washington State is better than I thought he was going to be right away. Um, that offense for Washington State is probably going to score quite a few points throughout the course of this season. And as we said before, you know, they haven't had their starting running back the last couple of weeks, and they've still been really good. So Washington State looks pretty good. The other one that I'll throw in, Cincinnati with 9.9 yards per play. This one really stood out to me because Cincinnati appears to be wanting to run up the score right now. You can't really blame them. Um, Ritter's really playing very well also of late. I still don't know if Ritter is an elite quarterback. I know some people based on his games the last couple of weeks are really talking him up a lot. He hasn't really beaten a really good team uh, by putting up those kind of stats yet. At the same time, like I said, it does look like Cincinnati wants to run up the score and who could blame them? You know, they really need to win games by margin right now because, you know, it could come down to something like that in the end. Yeah, and that's a really interesting game, obviously, for a ton of reasons here this week with Cincinnati and UCF. And I guess we can kind of break some games down here, sort of kill a couple birds with one stone as we talk about some of these numbers. That's a line that's run out this week. This was three and a half, four early in the week. I'm seeing some six and a halfs out there in the global and U.S. betting markets for Cincinnati and UCF. And that's the thing. Cincinnati's offense, I think, throughout the year has really developed nicely despite having a quarterback that – I would say is, you know, average to maybe slightly above average, depending on the opponent. UCF, I mean, look, they've left points on the field in several of their games so far this year. They move the ball extremely well. They've had 607 yards a game almost every time out. They've settled for some field goals. They've missed some field goals. They've been stopped inside the five. We all remember that game against Memphis specifically, where they blew that big lead. They wound up getting stopped a couple of times in the high percentage scoring areas, that's a really interesting game there. And, and my line on that game is three. So I'm, I'm leaning towards UCF in this one. I know everybody loves Cincinnati because they play good defense because they're running up scores, but also the Bearcats here. This is only their second true road game. They played at SMU, a game that was thought to be kind of a tough spot for them. That line was in the one, two range. Most of the week, they blew out SMU. So a good performance there, but I think this UCF team is a pretty big step up in class, at least offensively, for the Bearcats. Factor in travel, three straight road games to end the year. Cincinnati, I think, could be a team that maybe we could make some money betting against here at the end of the year, or maybe we find out they're just that good. Yeah, I don't think I want to bet against Cincinnati here. My line's four on that game. At the open, I believe this one was Cincinnati minus three some places. I would have considered taking Cincinnati at that. At this line, there's no way you can take Cincinnati because if you look at the lines a few weeks ago, it really wasn't that long ago that Cincinnati was plus two and a half at one point against SMU on the road. And so we see how much the market perception of Cincinnati has changed. I've wanted to be high on Cincinnati here throughout the course of the year. I think Fickle's a really good coach. Cincinnati's defense is much better than anybody else in the American athletic. Um, I don't think that's even a debate. That defense is really good. And, uh, you know, the question is, is Cincinnati's offense good enough to trade scores with UCF? I mean, I, I think that UCF will score here. UCF, like you said, they've been stopped on downs quite a bit um, in key spots. Um, I don't think they're going to be able to settle for field goals here, UCF. So I think we'll see them go for it quite a bit. We've talked about already before that I don't know that Heupel's a great coach. You know, they've dropped off a decent amount um, after Scott Frost. UCF's defense has really disappointed me. I thought that they should have been better than they were. I knew they had several guys opt out. They've had some injuries. But UCF has more talent than what they've shown on defense I don't know. I I can't take UCF here. I think Cincinnati is the team that's in really good form. But now at minus six and a half on Cincinnati, any kind of line value is gone. Yeah, I mean, if this runs up to seven, I'm probably going to take a piece of UCF just because it is so far off of my number. And and it is a step up in class for Cincinnati. That's very true. The AAC, really outside of Cincinnati and and UCF and maybe to a degree Tulsa, is a pretty weak conference here uh, for this year. So you know, I, I'm going to have to take what I perceive to be numbers value on UCF. If we touch seven, even if it's seven one twenty, I may take a piece of that. Uh, hope for seven one fifteen or lower. But yeah, I think it's pretty interesting. And again, you know, if let's say Cincinnati does get upset in this game and their college football playoff hopes are gone, 
then we sort of see what the metal is of Luke Fickle, how he gets this team back on track, stuff like that. So again, putting the cart before the horse there uh, in case Cincinnati loses this game, they probably won't. And based on the line movement, a lot of people do like Cincinnati here, but still things that you want to consider as we get deeper into the season here. One other note I want to mention, you know, I watched a lot of that Oregon Washington state game the other night and two things struck me about that game. The first is Oregon's defense is terrible. As you mentioned, 6.8 yards per play allowed on the season here so far. They are fundamentally bad. They take really bad tackling angles. I didn't like the way any of their guys in the back seven played in that game against Washington state. So there was that there were some weird turnovers and it was kind of a, a sloppy game in a lot of ways. The second thing is that Oregon looked bad in the first half and looked pretty damn good in the second half. They really made great adjustments and I don't know if that's a commentary on Cristobal. I don't know if that's a commentary on Rolovich and what he's trying to do with that team up there in Pullman, but maybe a trend we kind of want to watch here with Washington State a little bit that maybe they won't be the greatest of second-half teams, especially making adjustments with a true freshman who is talented in Delora, but it seemed like in the second half, the game just either sped up on him or just completely changed. Maybe that's something we can watch going forward with Washington State. Yeah, a couple things about that. Oregon's defense should be good. If you look at the talent they have, this should be a top six or eight defense in the country, and they don't look e- anything even close to that right now. I, I'm surprised they've been that bad. The secondary especially should be excellent. Uh, they haven't been so far this year. The, the other thing about that game that really struck me as I was watching it, right before halftime, Washington State let, lets Oregon go 80 yards in like 10 seconds. Uh, the two-play touchdown drive. I don't know how you let somebody get behind you in a spot like that. I thought that was a really bad defensive uh, mess up there from Washington state, Washington state had some momentum. Then Oregon scores that really long touchdown right before halftime. I think that changed the game quite a bit. So, um, you know, Washington state's defense, I think is a problem. And so far this year, Oregon's defense has been a problem. Like I said, I think they should be better, but they haven't been so far. Yeah. And I, I did cash a ticket on Oregon in that game, but I don't, Nessus, I mean, I know that they moved the football with ease. I, I don't know if they were the right side in that game or not, but um, I was happy to cash the ticket, but I also did downgrade Oregon a little bit in my power ratings coming out of that performance. A couple of other games that you or a couple of other teams, I should say, that had pretty good offensive performances last weekend that you wanted to key in on Houston, Illinois, which is a very big surprise. And, you know, we talked about Illinois and Rutgers and Rutgers being a touchdown favorite, a favorite in a Big Ten game for the first time since 2014. Uh, That wound up not working out particularly well for them. And uh, I really hope you didn't have the under in Wake Forest in North Carolina. No, I didn't. I didn't have that one. That one, man, uh, wasn't, let's see, Wake Forest was covering and then North Carolina had to cover for a minute, right? At the end and then, and then Wake Forest ended up winning. That would have been a terrible beat for those who had Wake Forest in that game. Wake Forest had 606 yards against North Carolina and they were outgained badly. I mean, when's the last time you see a team had over 600 yards and the opponent had 742? How throws for 550, 60 first downs in that game and 174 plays, really fast tempo. We've seen that from Wake Forest in the past. Like you said, I was about to take Wake Forest and Duke over this week, but that game ended up being canceled, kind of like Charlotte and Marshall. I really do think that was a good spot for Charlotte this week against Marshall. Marshall off that big win last weekend and the anniversary game, and then you know, kind of in a letdown spot. And Marshall was the team that we've kind of uh, looked for regression with, and I finally thought I had a good spot to play against them, but it, it didn't come to fruition. Um, Illinois ran for 341 yards on Rutgers, 341 yards. Um, Rutgers has had three turnovers that cost them the game as well, but that 341 yards allowed is uh, pretty unbelievable. Houston had 8.0 yards per play. The, their offense had been struggling quite a bit of late, but um, I guess the USF defense uh, helps people get back in and in rhythm pretty quickly. Yeah, USF is just, they're not a good team. And uh, I actually do have them favored this week against Navy. I don't know if that game winds up getting played or not. I guess that's kind of more of a, a commentary on Navy than anything else. Probably won't play that one despite the power ratings overlay. Uh, but UCF, a team I have been kind of following a little bit to try and see if there's any opportunity because their quarterback play the first three weeks of, the, of their season was just atrocious. And they made a quarterback change and it's gotten a little bit better. But now, of course, as you mentioned, they're having these defensive issues. So if it's not one thing, it's another for the South Florida Bulls. 
One other one to take a look at here, at least from an offensive standpoint on the positive side, Vanderbilt. And I played Vanderbilt against Kentucky last week because I'm sitting there thinking, okay, this this is like an 18-point line. Kentucky's not a team that I want to lay margin with. Low total in that game. Becomes a very high-scoring game, which was pretty surprising. But this is two weeks in a row now that Vanderbilt's offense has actually looked pretty decent. I don't understand how they could have scored 35 points on Kentucky. Kentucky's defense is a pretty solid defense. Kentucky's offense is usually the problem. I don't know what happened in that game. I was going to say, I remember you saying you liked Vanderbilt last week. That was a game that I passed on. That was definitely a good call. Uh, Kentucky laying that kind of points would, is probably a good fade in general based on their offense. But I, I can't believe they gave up so much on defense. Vanderbilt scores 35 points. Um, I kind of like Vanderbilt and Florida over this week because I think Florida will score a lot of points in that game. And if Vandy can put up a decent offense here this week, uh, we've seen that total move up some. And I think that's probably the right right move, at least. One from the negative side, I wanted to say, Cal with 2.8 yards per play against UCLA. Every week when I look at these box scores and I'm looking through these on Sunday night, there's usually one stat that kind of jumps out at me and I'm like, what? I mean, this, this was definitely the one this week. I'm, I'm thinking, how did they only get 2.8 yards per play? Look, we know Cal's not a good offense, but UCLA's defense is bad. I don't know what happened in that game. I don't know either. I mean, those are, those are Utah state esque numbers for yeah. Cal. I mean, that that's really bad. That's a UCLA team that, as you mentioned, terrible defense. I mean, Colorado marched up and down the field on them in that first game. And then Cal can't do anything. That was that was crazy. To your point about Florida and Vanderbilt, you know, I, and I kind of isolated this with Vanderbilt the previous week. They were minus five in turnover margin against Mississippi State, only lost by seven, badly outgained Mississippi State. And I don't know what it is, but Vanderbilt's offense is getting a little bit better. And everybody wants to take a look at, you know, what Florida did last week. They scored, what, 63 points against Arkansas, had, you know, all kinds of yards per play, stuff like that. And I know that game state kind of played into this a little bit, but Arkansas also had nine yards per play in that game against Florida. So Florida's defense, which has not been good all year, the one game they stepped up and played really well defensively in was the game against Georgia. And that would imply to me that Georgia's offense is that bad and maybe even worse than we thought because Florida the last two weeks now after playing Georgia – their defense hasn't really looked all that good. So Arkansas with nine yards per play, Vanderbilt all of the sudden, for whatever reason, starting to move the football. I think the over is in play there in that game. I don't know if I'll take Vandy getting 31, biggest road favorite role for Florida since 2001. Uh, but I think the over is, is a pretty good look there, you know, weather permitting, of course. Yeah, I, th- I think so too. I haven't bet that game, but that's one of them that's definitely on my strong lean list. And it's one that I'm going to consider. Um, I don't know what I would do with the side on that game. I, I, I don't know what to think. I think Florida puts up a massive number. I imagine Florida team total over is going to be a popular bet if, for people who are betting team totals. Um, I can't see Vanderbilt slowing down Florida at all in that one. It's just a question of whether Florida cares to keep scoring or not. So um, one more thing I wanted to say, Coastal Carolina through seven games. I don't know if we're going to talk about that game or not, but Coastal Carolina, big game here this week. Through seven games, averaging only 3.1 penalties per game. That's tremendous. Um, I'll, I'll throw in with it. You know, we've talked about this in past years. It's the case both in football and basketball. I don't really know why it is. I don't think you know why it is. The American Athletic Conference loves to call uh, fouls, and they love to, call, to throw penalty flags. Every week you can watch a Tulsa game, an SMU game. They're just throwing flags for everything. And, uh, I mean, you're always going to see the top – uh, penalized teams are going to be some of the AAC teams. Coastal Carolina, on the other hand, through seven games has been great, a really well-coached team, and you have to wonder uh, how long they'll have their coach. Yeah, you wonder if Chadwell is going to get that currently vacant South Carolina job. You know, I mean, that's that's just an obvious connection that, that people are already making. And to your point about the AAC, I mean, what was it? It was uh, UCF had like 50 penalties in their first three games, right? They're still averaging 10.4 penalties per game. Tulsa averaging 10.2. Uh, so, you know, that does tend to help scoring a little bit uh, in the AAC, to say the least. A couple of things that I want to mention here uh, before we move on to some regression teams. The Boise State game. I mean, we can't mention box scores without mentioning that one. Boise State, 4.34 yards per play, but they scored 52 points against Colorado State. 
They had three special teams touchdowns, two blocked punts, and a field goal run back for six. So that was obviously a very misleading game there. Um, Miami, 4.5 yards per play for the Hurricanes. They ran 86 plays in that one-point win over Vatek. Very inefficient offense, and I finally did downgrade Miami, Florida in my power ratings. Um, you know, and that was probably something that's been building for a couple of weeks' time here. And then one more, San Diego State. They win in cover, but their quarterback, Carson Baker, not to be confused with Colson Baker, who is, of course, Machine Gun Kelly, four for 13 for 30 yards with two interceptions, and they still cover the number last week. Uh, San Diego State, I mean, look, if they face any defense in the Mountain West that can stop the run, they're going to be in trouble. Yeah, I think that one really stands out. Um, I had Miami and Virginia Tech over, and I was surprised that neither of those teams could, could do more offensively in that game. The thing for Virginia Tech is they haven't been able to stop the run. They stopped the run against Miami, and they still find a way to lose that game. I know that had to be disappointing for Hokies fans. One more box score one that stood out to me, Louisville and Virginia. Virginia 34, Louisville 17. Louisville's the new king of winning the box score and losing the game. They've done that a lot this year. Uh, 478 yards to 368 for Virginia, 8.0 yards per play, only 5.7 for Virginia, three turnovers for Louisville and 0 for 2 on fourth down. So essentially turnovers there. Hawkins and Atwell both missed the game and Hawkins opts out then. Um, I don't know what to think of Louisville going forward. I still think Satterfield's a good coach. They haven't played as good as I thought they would this year, but 34 17 this game should have been a lot higher scoring first of all and Louisville um continues to win the box score and lose the game yeah and Scott Satterfield was very animated after that game I mean you know he he did not mince words in his post-game press conference he was not happy and and I can't blame him for that and, and we've talked about Louisville you know at several junctures this year as a team that we expected to be you know they'd be a few notches below Clemson obviously but expected to be the second best team in that Atlantic division, I think. And that has just not been the case at all whatsoever. I mean, it's, if it's, it hasn't been one thing, it's been another for them. Turnover margin has been a big issue. They're not taking care of the football. Um, you know, the red zone has been a factor for them. Just a lot of issues there for Louisville. And I, I wonder if maybe Scott Satterfield has some discontent in the program that he needs to get rid of and sort of establish his players, establish his culture, something like that where, you know, sometimes it takes these coaches two, three, four seasons to kind of get guys that buy in. And then, of course, you know, they kind of take off from there. I think that may be the case for Louisville. Maybe next year, Louisville play on team. Or maybe after they make the switch from Cunningham, Louisville could be a play on team when Satterfield gets his coach in there. But to that point, and I think this is a good segue into talking about the regression stats here, I think Virginia is massively overrated right now. And I feel like I've been kind of chasing their power rating over the course of the season, maybe consciously or subconsciously. Look, this is a Virginia team. They're laying 40 this week against Abilene Christian. So I don't know if we have an opportunity this week. I hope they blow them out and we get an opportunity down the line. But Virginia's being outgained by over 1.2 yards per play this season. They're 6.44 allowed on defense, 5.21 gained on offense. They're minus three in turnover margin, so it's not like they're winning games because they're winning the turnover battle or anything like that. I think this team is on a crash course to regression town, and I'm looking forward to opportunities to go against them. I agree, and I hope they do win this game this weekend by a lot because I think that will give us some value going against them. It'll be a shame if they win this game by 20 points or something, and then uh, everybody else wants to fade them the next week and they go too low. So uh, I think that's a really good point. Well, I'll go with West Virginia next. So you and I both like West Virginia last weekend against TCU. That was certainly a good call. I had the under in that game as well. I watched a lot of that game. West Virginia's defense is very good, but TCU's offense is really, really bad. I mean, we talked about that last week. They have nothing to threaten a good defense with. Uh, West Virginia's defense is very good, but I don't think they're quite as good as they look right now. Their opponents have scored a touchdown only six out of 14 trips into the red zone. Look at the schedule they've played, too. West Virginia has really played a weak schedule so far this year. Um, TCU's offense is really bad. West Virginia is going to give up some more points here in the future. So I think if we see really low totals in their game, we might be able to take some low overs here going forward. Because I think West Virginia's defense, while it's good, it's not quite as good as it looks right now. 
Yeah, I think that's fair. I really do like Neil Brown. I think he's doing a fantastic job there in Morgantown. And, you know, if he gets maybe a more potent offense as he goes forward, you know, and keeps the defense at a high level, that could be a very interesting team in the Big 12 going forward in a more traditional season because Morgantown is a very hard place to play. They get a lot of those noon kickoffs. So a lot of those, you know, central U.S. Big 12 teams with that little bit of a time change playing at 11 a.m., stuff like that. I think Neil Brown trending in the right direction, but I agree that there may be some opportunities to go against West Virginia here in the near future. And furthermore, TCU, you know, their offense is bad. I mean, there's no question about that. They're also up to 5.93 yards per play allowed on defense. Last year, 5.26. Two years ago, 4.85. I don't know if this is a reflection of the offense or if maybe TCU's defense just isn't up to par right now, maybe not up to par going forward, I don't know, is maybe Gary Patterson kind of losing that team or losing that program a little bit, losing the recruiting battle in the state of Texas to a higher degree? I'm not entirely sure, but this TCU defense isn't nearly as stout or as formidable as it's been in the past either. Yeah, it's hard to say. I think the defense is worse. Uh, the offense has a lot of three and outs, and that definitely hurts the defense quite a bit, you know, being on the field so much. At the same time, um, you know, I thought of Patterson as a great defensive mind, and really they've given up quite a few yards to teams that they shouldn't have so far this year. So I think TCU, not very good in general this season. So I, I don't know if uh, the past stats matter as much. Maybe Patterson's not quite as good as he used to be. I mean, we do see coaches who have been really good kind of uh, – you know, weekend over time, you know, and maybe that's the case here with Gary Patterson. I'm going to give a couple others here on defense, Oklahoma's defense opponents, 27, 27.96% on third down this year. I don't think that can continue. Oklahoma has been pretty good on defense this year, but they're still going to give up their points this season on a positive regression. Real quickly on on Oklahoma. What do you think about the Bedlam line this week? You know, I, I thought nine and a half was high. I think seven is still a little bit high. Um, but you know, as you mentioned, Oklahoma has been good on third down. They've got a good offense with Spencer Rattler, Oklahoma state, maybe something of a regression candidate, certainly in those third down situations on their own. What do you think about that line here this week for Bedlam? Oh, I don't know if uh, Wallace is going to play in this game. And I think that matters here. Um, Spencer Sanders hasn't been as good as I thought he would be. Um, I know that sometimes he kind of keys in on Wallace and, and doesn't look at other people. Um, The question is, can Oklahoma stop the run game of Oklahoma State? I wouldn't think they'd be able to consistently stop them. This line is still bigger than what I made it here, so I would lean Oklahoma State. I kind of got greedy and was hoping I'd get a 10 when I saw nine and a half with extra juice. And uh, that was, that was a mistake. You know, you see bet online minus nine and a half minus 115. And I said, well, I'll wait till the next day and hope I get a 10. And then, you know, I look at the next day and it's seven or seven and a half. And Um, I don't know if I'm going to do anything with that game. I do see weather as a a potential problem in that game, or I might've thought the, the over would have been a good play because I think that both of those teams are due for some defensive regression. My guess is I'll end up not playing that game now. Yeah. I, I mean, look, there's a couple of seven and a halfs out there in the, in the U S markets, I think are, you know, maybe worth taking a look at Uh, like you. I was, I was wondering, you know, And and shame on me because, you know, I've been chasing Oklahoma State's power rating all year long. Obviously, the market has had them power rated higher than I have. All of a sudden, it seems like that narrative has kind of flipped a little bit here to the point where now I'm showing an overlay that I have Oklahoma State too high. Maybe I have Oklahoma too low. I should have probably been aware enough that a 10 wasn't coming just because of what I've had to do with my power ratings on Oklahoma State throughout the year. But you know, you you do want to try to extract as much line value as you possibly can. And the unfortunate side effect of that is sometimes you wind up missing a number, you know, and I had the Tulsa number run out on me for Thursday night too. When I liked four, four and a half, I have that one like eight and a half. It's six, six and a half. Now I'm writing an article. And as I'm writing the article, the opening line report over at ATS.io, the board lights up and the line moves on both Tulsa and Oklahoma state. So you know, in trying to do my part, being a man of the people, I lost some line value on those two games. So uh, I don't know, maybe I need to shift my priorities next week. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, uh, on my, on my part, I I do think I should have taken the nine and a half. However, when you sit and think about it, you think, well, 10 is pretty important number nine and eight aren't as important as 10. So maybe I should wait for the 10 and then it doesn't come. It's easy to say after the fact, I guess. And and furthermore too, with both of us having that number lower, 
you sit there and you think, why is this line so high? And then by the time you answer your own question, the number moves. And you're like, well, well, okay, I guess it was too high. Yeah, yeah, I will say Oklahoma State hasn't had much success against Oklahoma here in recent seasons. So um, that does concern me a bit. I think Gundy's a good coach, but it seems like Lincoln Riley kind of has his number. So I don't know. I think I'll probably end up passing on that game. And if Oklahoma State looks really good, then both of us are going to be kicking ourselves, certainly. Um, One that you already pointed out kind of, Colorado State, I mean, they're 36th in yards per play allowed. They're 107th in points per game allowed. They've only played two games, and one of them was that game against Boise State, and that's why that one um, stands out. Positive regression on defense, you would think. Um, Colorado State is kind of a hard team for me to raid. I think that they're kind of messing around with who's going to be their quarterback. It seems like O'Brien's their better quarterback. They really want to play the younger guy. Um, I don't know what to do with Colorado State right now, but it looks like their defense is a little bit better than – uh, they they appear at least in the points per game. Um, Illinois' offense, positive regression, I would think here, 70th in yards per play, 115th in points per game, only 31.37% on third down. Um, Illinois, I think, could be a good over team here as we go forward. Their defense is really bad. I had kind of thought I might want the over Illinois and Nebraska, and then I looked at the weather report and decided I didn't want the over in that game. So I'm not sure that I can take the under, but looks like some wind and rain or snow is a possibility in that game. Uh, We'll see as it gets later in the week. One more, Rutgers offense, 118th in yards per play, but 82nd in points per game they have some defensive scores short fields look this offense is better than they were last year it's hard to not be better than they were last year but they're not as good as they look so far this year and we saw the market kind of get ahead of themselves with Rutgers last week and I think that was more about Ohio State really kind of goofed around in the second half of that Rutgers and Ohio State game and then people thought Rutgers maybe they're actually good while they're better they're still not good yeah, no, I agree. And, and you know, Ryan Day was not happy about how Ohio State finished that game, and neither was Justin Fields. And I give them credit for that. You know, I mean, look, it, they're, they're a big favorite in a lot of their games. They're a big favorite again this week. We'll do a highlight video on Indiana and Ohio State here uh, in a little bit. But, you know, hey, I mean, look, I, I appreciate that we're kind of getting to a point now, and we're seeing it with Luke Fickle, and we're seeing it with some other guys where – I love that these coaches are kind of getting this mentality of, you know what, if you don't want us to score, then stop us. I, I don't care what the score is. I don't care what the game state is. You know, I'm getting guys out there that, that don't play or that are going to play for me next year. If you don't want those guys to score, that's on you. And, and I think that's the way it should be. You know, these kids that are, you know, true freshmen, redshirt freshmen, whatever else that come off the bench that are going to play at some point in time. Why, why should they play left-handed, so to speak, just because the game's out of hand? They should be able to run the offense as the offense is designed, and the other coach should just sit there and take it and tell his team, look, if you don't want to get embarrassed, make some stops. Yeah, I totally agree. And, uh, you know, kind of a baseball uh, similarity is, you know, remember with the whole 3 0 and hitting a home run when you're way up was, I think that was Tatis Jr. Um, you know, if you, if you don't want to give up a home run, uh, don't throw it right down the middle and you can't blame a guy for hitting a home run or you can't blame a team for scoring when they're already up eight or nine in baseball. You never know what's going to happen. And here in football, it, it, similarly, like you said, you know, you, you look at these and you say, well, you know, a team's just running up the middle and just absolutely killing somebody. What are they supposed to do? I mean, you know, if you want to stop them, if you don't want them to get that many points, then go ahead and stop them. I, I agree with that. Definitely. So I think we'll see that probably continue to be a more widespread thought in the future. I certainly hope so. One team I want to ask you about from a regression standpoint, uh, we'll try to cram in some tempo changes and things right after this. So Penn state, right? So Penn state's 0 and four, uh, you know, you and I have our questions about James Franklin and I think deservedly. So this is not an 0 and four football team. I mean, from a box score standpoint, they've they've clearly won two of them. Again, the game against Indiana and then the game against Nebraska this past week. Um, but you know, they're also there's some disconnect. There's some sort of flaw in the programming of this team. From a yards per play standpoint, I think they're minus point one seven yards per play, something like that. They're not an zero and four team. They're probably more like a two and two team. You can make a case for one and three, but I don't think they're as bad as the market is making them out to be that being said, and you and I, I know we both are looking at Penn state this week. Can can we do it? Can you do it? I I don't know if I can. 
I know I couldn't take the other side. Uh, the question is whether I take Penn State. Um, I know there were some threes with extra juice. Um, I assume it's still two and a half pretty much across the board. That's the last I saw. I, if it gets to a three flat, I, I will definitely strongly think about taking Penn State. I think Penn State's one of those teams where you can't win a box score as much as they have um, in a couple of those games and not want to bet them getting three points at home against a team like Iowa. I think Iowa's a good team. I don't think Iowa's a really good team. It's certainly not a really good offense. Um, you know, Iowa just beat up on Minnesota. I think that's more about Minnesota than it is about Iowa. Penn State, you know, I don't like James Franklin. We've talked about this before. Uh, I don't know what he's going to do now going forward. You know, I know he was thought to be maybe a good fit for an even better job or a different job because uh, some people think it would be an upgrade to go someplace like Texas or USC. Not sure that people are going to really want him that bad after this season. I don't know what Penn State will do there. I think that the big question is, does Penn State care to keep playing really hard the rest of the season? And that's really my question. If I know I'm going to get a strong effort from them, I'm taking Penn State money line or plus two and a half. I'm not really sure what they're going to do from here on out. So I certainly lean Penn State heavily, but I'm not sure yet. That's an excellent point. I think apathy is something that we have to start handicapping now, especially with the strictness of the COVID protocols and and all of that. You know, how long do these college kids want to be boxed in, you know, and and not be – living that college experience and all of that, especially if, you know, their season is going off the rails. I mean, at this point, Penn State won't even make a bowl game for whatever bowl games are out there with the way that they're trending. So, you know, how long are the players invested and engaged? I think that's a really good question to ask, specifically about a team like Penn State, and there will be others that pop up as we kind of go forward here. So, you know, like again, I mean, I, it's a tough – again, I have line value on them. I had line value on them last week, and I played them, and they – did nothing in the red zone. They were one for six on touchdowns, two turnovers on downs, three short field goals. And that's how they lost the game. They outgained Nebraska by what? 200 yards. I think it was more than 200 yards, something like that. So they're there in the box score. They're just not there in the results. And then you kind of get that question of, well, can I take them or do I have to just leave that game alone? Uh, you mentioned to me before the show that you had a, a long time listener reach out asking about some tempo changes here in college football, we talk a lot about tempo in college basketball, and I'm sure we'll do that more as the season hopefully goes along. But from a college football standpoint, five teams going faster, three teams going slower. Just go ahead and rattle those off in succession here. Yeah, I was going to say, I'll keep it quick because I want to make sure we can talk a little bit of college oh, basketball. Oh, with tempo changes, I get it. Keeping it quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I didn't really try to do that, but I should have said I did. South Florida, 25.92 seconds between plays. Uh, last year, 24 seconds between plays this year, 23.3 in conference play. You could say that that's playing from behind. They have to go fast, and that's certainly part of it. But South Florida has sped up a bit. UTSA, 25.79 between plays last year, 23.62. This year, uh, UTSA, the Roadrunners, are playing quite a bit quicker this season. Uh, North Texas, 23.87 last year between snaps, which is actually pretty quick. This year, 19.04. I don't think I've seen anybody play that fast over the course of a season. So if they play that fast the rest of this year, I think that's the fastest I will have ever seen. Uh, North Texas, a team that I can only bet overs with. Colorado State, 25.88 seconds between plays to 22.74. I know they said they wanted to play faster so far this year. They have definitely done that. And Arkansas, 25.55 all the way up to 22.62. So Arkansas playing much faster here under the new coaching staff. Uh, Again, a team that's had some pretty high scoring games lately that uh, if you're you're betting an under with Arkansas, you want to have a pretty high number. I'll talk here briefly about a couple slower teams. Washington State, 24.87 between snaps. This year, 28 and a half. Um, That one really stands out to me because I wasn't sure what Washington State would do with tempo as far as how much slower. They're quite a bit slower. It's just they've been really bad on defense and and really efficient on offense. Um, Iowa State, 26.47, up to 28.29 between snaps. And then Akron, Akron 26.31 to 28.24. They're going to try to play keep away when they can. Um, They played a good first half against Kent State last night, and then everything fell apart. I think they have to try to hide the defense. It's just hard to do. Would you say that last night between Akron and Kent State, the wagon wheels fell off for Akron? Yeah, that's what – yeah, I made made that – some kind of joke like that last night and then put a Darius Rucker gif up. Uh, Love that song, by the way. That's a – 
Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. My, uh, my daughter likes to listen to that song as she tries to fall asleep and she's only four. So I feel like that's a pretty good start. Um, you know, as far as if you got a taste for music, I feel like that's a pretty good start, but yeah, uh, the wagon wheel, uh, uh, things totally fell off there for Akron in that one. Wasn't it tied at halftime? Yeah. Yeah, I think Gosh. it was tied, yeah, right before half or something like that. Yeah, right, right before half. 69 man. points. I mean, nice number for Kent State. Credit <laughs> yeah. for them. Uh, Sean Lewis, I, I don't know how quick he leapfrogs somewhere else, but Kent State in the second half of last year and what they've done so far here this season with an offensive, you know, minded game across all levels now, that dude's going to get a decent job here moving forward, I think. And I'll be really curious to see, you know, what his ceiling is. Oh, winds up being so that's a pretty interesting one and you mentioned Arkansas of course Kendall Bryles the reason why they're playing so much faster there in uh, in Fayetteville so you know uh tempo changes are very important it is good to know these things just to recap real quickly here teams moving quite a bit faster this season South Florida UTSA North Texas Colorado State which is surprising with Adazio by the way and then Arkansas then the slower teams Washington State Iowa State and Akron we'll talk more about Iowa State here uh, in a minute but You know what? Not a lot of time for games here because we want to try and work in some college football stuff. We are going to do quick breakdowns for highlight videos on Kansas State, Iowa State, and also Ohio State, or uh, Indiana, Ohio State. As far as the rest of the card, Kyle, I know we've been criticized for not giving out enough picks on the show. So uh, just kind of wondering here, any games that, that stand out to you that maybe you've already played that have moved or things that are kind of under consideration for you on the rest of the card? Um, You know, the only other side that I had played here going forward was Charlotte. So um, I would have said that one, but it is tough. Again, you got to wait for COVID. Right, right. And and actually, I like a couple of the ones that we're going to talk about here quite a bit. So I was going to bring up Penn State and Iowa, but you already did. So uh, I don't I don't know that I have any others that really interest me that much. And and uh, I think think I like a couple of these that we're about to talk about for highlight videos quite a bit. One, I guess I'll throw out real quickly here. South Carolina is a mess. I mean, you know, I I think getting rid of Will Muschamp is the right move long term. But in the interim, they've pissed off that entire defense. McQuamu has already opted out. He's going to get ready for the NFL draft. Uh, J.C. Horn has opted out as well. They've got some guys on defense that are thinking about it. Uh, The offense, you know, Mike Bobo was hired as the offensive coordinator. Now, all of a sudden, what, after six games or whatever, he's now the interim head coach. I didn't really love that offensive coordinator hire to begin with. And now he's the guy who's the interim. So they'll probably be shifting gears on the offensive side going forward. Will he be loyal to Colin Hill the rest of the way? Will he go with Holinsky? What will they do? There's a lot of shit going on in Columbia right now for the visiting team from Columbia, Missouri to be laying under a touchdown. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what to do with that game. I, I could only take the visitor. Um, yeah, I, I feel like you're not getting great line value, but you no, know, it not. doesn't, I mean, it doesn't, I don't know if it matters. So I think that's the case in some of the other games this week. Um, I'll say East Carolina is a game that the line has already moved a lot. And I think that they still might be the right side temple starting a freshman who would have been like fourth or fifth on their um, quarterback list coming into the season, real mess they are. And I think uh, you and I are both pretty low on Rod Carey. So uh, I'm happy to go against him. So East Carolina is one that I'm strongly considering betting here later this week. The only other one I've got, if USC and Utah gets played and the line is three, I'm going to take Utah. I'd love to get a three and a half, but USC has just been very underwhelming here so far. Kyle Whittingham's a great head coach. Hopefully their COVID issues will be behind them and they'll have a pretty full complement of players. That's something I'll have to read up more on. But uh, for right now, I, I do like Utah a little bit plus the three, maybe a three and a half shows up with the COVID worries. Maybe just play the money line, but you know, USC here, they just they they have not impressed me at all. Back to back road games now playing at altitude in Salt Lake City. Uh, I just I, I got to look at Utah. I think uh, if anything there in that one. But with that, we'll go ahead and do a highlight video for this matchup between Indiana and Ohio State. Ohio State twenty and a half point favorite. Total of sixty six. This is game three fifty seven three fifty eight. I'm host Adam Burke, joined by professional better and handicapper Kyle Hunter. Full disclosure: we are both Ohio State fans, but we are very objective in our analysis of the Buckeyes across the board. We don't play a lot of Buckeyes games, but there is something interesting about this game for both of us here. 
Yeah, I'm going to start with Indiana. I, I think uh, Tom Allen's a really good coach. I like him. Done a great job. I like his energy, enthusiasm. Indiana so far this year unbeaten, but they're negative 0.2 yards per play. So just barely negative in a yards per play margin on the year. It's hard to be 4-0 and and be negative in yards per play margin. And that stands out as a big regression candidate. The only reason I didn't bring that up is because I knew we we're going to talk about this game on highlight video. I think that uh, Ohio State had an extra week to get ready for this game. They should have plenty of motivation for this because Indiana is undefeated. This is the big noon game that they're hyping quite a bit here this week. Indiana, you know, Allen has said uh, we're a team that we think can win the Big Big Ten this year. Look, Indiana's much improved, and I know he has to say that, so I don't say anything against him for saying that. But Indiana has a big uh, step still to take um, as they go forward. Indiana really should have lost that game against Penn State. And then Indiana, I mean, you know, what do you say after that? Well, Michigan's a mess right now. Michigan State, Michigan State's awful. I don't know how Michigan State beat Michigan. That's That one's a head scratcher for sure. Um, to me, Ohio State had an extra week to get ready for this game. They have huge talent advantages across the board. I don't think anybody can deny that. I don't know why Ohio State wouldn't want to win this game pretty big. You know, I feel like this is a really good chance for them to make a statement. And if they're, if they're going to make a statement, it's good to do it against a team that's 4-0 and perception is really high on them right now. Um, as long as the weather stays good here, I think Ohio State minus the points could be a good play. It looks like the weather's not too bad, at least so far. Indiana on the ground, I wanted to say 2.66 yards per carry. I think if you're going to beat Ohio State this year, you're going to move a lot on that defense. You need to be able to run the football really well. Um, I don't think Indiana can do that. I think Penix will be under pressure in this game, and he is playing a much better secondary than he's been playing in the past. I think Ohio State on offense can expose Indiana's secondary, which is not very good. A team like Michigan State last week, I mean, they can't expose the secondary. So, uh, And Michigan, you know, they got some yards, but that was because they were so far behind. I think Indiana up front is stronger than they are in the back. Fields has looked really good as a passer this year. He looks healthier than he did last year as well. I think Ohio State puts up a big number here. And while I don't usually like to lay the points with Ohio State, I think it's the right side in this game. I absolutely agree with everything that you said. You you cannot bring a squirt gun to an AK-47 fight with Ohio State. I mean, you just – you can't do it. This is an Indiana offense that is undefeated with less than five – or fewer than five yards per play, 4.95 on the year. If you want to beat Ohio State, as you said – you have to have one of two things. You have to have a dynamic offense that can actually go toe-to-toe with what the Buckeyes do offensively, or you have to have a great running game to play keep away. And Indiana has neither one of those things. So I think Ohio State very much to play here. And as we talked about a little bit earlier on this edition of ATS Radio, Ohio State, maybe the best thing that could have possibly happened to them was struggling in the second half against Rutgers because Ryan Day was not happy. Justin Fields was not happy. The defense came out and said, look, we got to play better in the second halves of games, even if we've got big leads. They refocus after that Rutgers game. I think they would have blown out Maryland last week. They would have named the score in that game. Indiana is a better team than Maryland. I'm not denying that at all whatsoever. This line's also lower, and I think Ohio State will name the score here. The one thing that worries me is they could get off – to a little bit of a slow start. They've done that before in the past against Indiana, but maybe that even increases their focus here with a head coach like Ryan Day, who I think the players greatly respect, gravitate towards, listen and hang on every word that he says. Ohio State big in this game, I think, is absolutely the way to look at it. Yeah, and if they do start slow, I think Ohio State live would be a really good bet as well because maybe you're able to get something like Ohio State minus 16 or something like that instead of the minus 20 or 20 and a half. Um, I think this line probably closes a little bit higher than it is right now. So I think if you like Ohio State, you want to play it earlier rather than later. Um, I think Indiana is a much improved team. I think both of us think that. It's just this is a big step up in class. Ohio State in about as good a spot as you could get, you know, barring some, you know, COVID or injury news here from Ohio State that we don't expect. I think Ohio State wins pretty big in this one. And also, too, I mean, they lost the game last week against a horrific Maryland defense that would have padded Justin Fields' Heisman resume. So, you know, you got to think in the second halves of games here, they're going to try and push for that, too, much like we've seen Florida do with Kyle Trask. So I think it makes sense to actually lay the number here with Ohio State. Again, very objective analysis from us, a matchup-based handicap here for this Indiana versus Ohio State game in Week 12. 
You'll get a lot of great insight and analysis here on our full editions of ATS Radio, which you can subscribe to on Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, wherever you stream and download your podcast content. All right. Uh, I don't think I want to do a second highlight video here simply because we're running out of time for today's show. I know you've got a hard stopping point here uh, at one hour. So really quickly, you and I both like Kansas State here, game 403-404 against Iowa State. And to me, I think there are two things about this handicap that are pretty simple here. The first is, as you mentioned, Iowa State playing slower this year, 28.29 seconds between snaps. Last year, 26.47 It's harder to get margin when you play slower. So that's a big part of it. High spread, low total. I like Kansas State for that reason. And also, too, both of these teams are teams you want to play on in the underdog role. Well, one of them's a double-digit dog. The other's a double-digit favorite. And we know Matt Campbell is just generally better against the spread as a dog. Absolutely. I've got a few stats that I want to say about this one. Um, You know, Kansas State has a huge special teams edge in this game, and and I think everybody knows that, but that could be really important in a lower scoring game, getting double digits. Baylor, 6.1 yards per play last game, Iowa State 5.6. You could argue Baylor should have won that game. They had a lead for much of that game. Both teams play almost exactly the same tempo, 28 and a half seconds between snaps. I like the under in this one. I still kind of like the under in this one. It's almost down to my number, but now we're at, you know, wind and rain or snow expected in this game. I think this could be a really low scoring game because, you know, Iowa State's run defense is really good. Kansas State's going to want to run in this game. I don't know that they can run very well. At the same time, from a side standpoint, five of the last six matchups between these two teams have been decided by five points or less. So now we're getting double digits. Kansas State won last year by 10 at home. So that's the one that wasn't five points or less. Um, I think this should be a close game. The only concern I have here is Iowa State has the best run D in the Big 12. Kansas State unlikely to be able to throw a lot. Iowa State also ranks ninth in the nation in yards per carry on the year. Kansas State's only been average stopping the run. But I think if the weather is bad, that helps Kansas State quite a bit because it takes the deep passing game with Brock Purdy kind of out of the equation a bit because, you know, if it's windy and snowy or raining, they're unlikely to be able to throw the ball deep here. And that makes Kansas state load up the box and and do better. I do like the under still at this number. I also like Kansas state. It's hard to not like double digits with this low of a total. And, you know, Kansas state is a team that you like to bet as an underdog, like you said, and we're getting quite a few points here. And what is climbing like nine and three or 10 and three against the spread as a dog already at Kansas state. Like, I mean, he's, he's an ATM machine as a dog. He's, he's following in the footsteps of Bill Snyder, who's one of the best underdog ATS coaches of all time. So both these teams off of a buy. Again, if you expect a lower scoring expectation here, then Kansas State is the play, getting double digits. And, and something else kind of interesting too, this is about where the line against Oklahoma State opened two weeks ago for Kansas State. Then that line ran out up to 14, which was obviously the wrong move as Kansas State outgained Oklahoma State, should have won the game outright. And this one opens in that same range. And I don't power rate Oklahoma State and Iowa State the same. So, you know, I think that this line is is definitely too high, is out of whack. And I would get this one early at 10 and a half or 11, because I do think as that weather forecast gets clearer, as people realize, hey, holy shit, it's climbing, you know, getting double digits. This one probably closes nine or nine and a half, in my opinion. I think there's a good chance of that, too, because I think the total probably keeps going down, and that at some point should correlate with the underdog. All right, so we're going to try and do some rapid-fire college or college basketball stuff. We will do more college basketball next week because we're recording on Monday, and I'll still post the show to release on Wednesday because I don't want to release a, multiple shows on the same days. So we're recording Monday or afternoon I'll post the show on Wednesday. So we'll do more college basketball stuff on next week's show because, you know, the odds are going to move for college football and all of that. And it's just preseason talk for the most part with college hoops. But real quickly here, a couple of things I wanted to make mention of uh, resources. You know, what do you use to find college basketball information leading up to the year? Yeah, let's start with the, the previews for the season. I like the blue ribbon basketball. It's about 400 pages. Uh, great information. The second one, which I know you sent me the other day, I've looked at this site in the past, the three-man weave, and to be honest, I think they've really upgraded their their, uh, previews here. They're they're much better than they were before. They're very analytical, very advanced um, 
breakdowns of types of offenses and defenses. So they complement each other because the blue ribbon basketball really talks about, you know, team chemistry and what they did in the off season and, and things like that. Three man weave is more about, you know, what kind of sets they run and, and what kind of things like that. So I think those are two really good ones. If you want to look at previews for the preseason, um, other things, uh, we've talked about the Torvik website. Bart Torvik's site is a very good site. I think Haslam Metrics is a really good site as well that's underrated by quite a bit. And one that I just kind of discovered because of Three Man Weave is Dribble Handoff. Um, they've got some really good information that um, I believe that's a free sign up. And, and it looks to me like Dribble Handoff is going to be a really good analytic, analytical site to look at. But if you're just starting out for the season, you know, everybody looks at Ken Palm. I think Ken Palm is a really good one. And that maybe is a good segue into what we would talk about next. But, you know, Ken Palm is a great site. The problem is everybody looks at it now. So uh, you have to kind of think outside the box if you're going to use Ken Palm all the time. Yeah, and, and we we talk a lot about Bart Torvik's website on this show. That's one that you and I both love, one that I think we've exposed a lot of our listeners to uh, over the last couple of years. Haslam Metrics is very good. I've been reading the three-man weave previews. Those are excellent. Uh, dribble handoff, something I'll have to take a look at here as well. The, the reason why we kind of stack rank Ken Palm a little bit lower is exactly what you said. Everybody uses it. And in fact, Bet Rivers posted some lines for, I believe, next Friday's games. There are some marquee games scheduled for next Friday, and then some games of the year over the course of the season. And basically, all Bet Rivers did was copy what the look ahead number is from Ken Palm. So if you think using Ken Palm gives you an edge over the market, it absolutely does not. Right, right. So, um, let's talk quickly about using Ken Palm and what I think would be the best way to look at it. Because I think early in season, the best way to look at Ken Palm is to try to fade some teams that Ken Palm thinks will improve a lot based on returning production because Ken Palm uses a pretty aggressive um, expectation as far as who's going to improve if they have everybody coming back. But sometimes when we talk about this in college football, sometimes the teams just aren't very good. Maybe these guys just aren't that good and he's expecting them to jump 80 or 100 spots in the rankings and it's like wait a minute I think this might be a good bet against I think that's the best way to look at Ken Palm early in the season is to fade teams that he thinks based on returning production are going to get way better when it's it's hard to believe they are going to get way better if they're the guys aren't that good especially if the coach isn't great so I think that's a good way to look at it um uh, second way also I think later in the season is to look for some recency trends. You know, Ken Palm can take a little bit to adjust on totals. Um, I've been able to make some money in the past looking at recency and, and tempo changes. Ken Palm isn't very aggressive on those uh, recency trends. And I think that's a good way to make, uh, make money uh, going forward is to be a little bit more aggressive than Ken Palm is based on tempo changes. Well, and we'll talk more about this on, on our Monday recording that we'll release on Wednesday, but like something like Bart Torvik, he's got like game by game charts where you can see, you know, tempo changes from teams and things of that sort that I think are really beneficial. Something I know you and I both use uh, rather frequently, and we'll talk about coaching changes and tempo changes here on our next show. But I guess the, the last thing to to say here, and I mean, this is obviously a very loaded question, but in terms of your college basketball preparations, you've got a week until the season starts. We're going to get a lot of cancellations. We've already had a lot of teams shutting down practice, coaches with COVID, players with COVID. We're going to find out about conferences that are either going to start late or not play at all. So something I thought was interesting that you texted me uh, last night, I believe it was, sort of trying to get my feeling on which conferences you know, should we be focusing on because obviously not all of them are going to play depending on – you know, the school administrators, what they've done with football, what the governors are saying, how restricted things are. For example, you know, New Mexico State, they've relocated to Phoenix because they can't they can't congregate for practice or events in New Mexico. The New Mexico Lobos are going to do the same thing. So I think that's an important thing for our listeners to take away here is try to focus on the conferences that have a really high probability of trying to give this thing, pardon the pun, the old college try. Yeah, good one. Um, I, I think that, you know, we could we could assume obviously the Ivy League's already out, and I, I would assume that there will be a few others that are going to be out. I would assume some of the ones, uh, the bigger names, especially in the South, would be more likely to try to play. 
Um, so definitely we talk about specialization. So you want to specialize in the ones that you think are definitely going to play at this point. And I want to talk next week a lot about coaching changes, because I think that's a really good way to start the season is to talk about what you think will be a lot different than the year before, because that's where you find the most value usually. And we will definitely do that. Once again, uh, like we said, more college basketball next week's show recording earlier than the release time. So it makes sense for us to talk more college basketball on next week's show with professional better and handicapper Kyle Hunter from huntersportspicks.com. And Kyle, what's going on over at the website right now, buddy? I'm going to put up the college basketball pass here later this week. It's going to be an early bird special, 499 bucks for every play. That's a little bit cheaper than what I've done in the past years. Part of that is I think there won't be as many games, and I'm going to try to be a little bit lower volume based on all the, the unknowns and the changes. But 499 bucks, the early bird price there. Um, if you want to get that, you can go over to the site at huntersportspicks.com. You can also send me a message, Kyle at huntersportspicks.com, and follow me on Twitter at Kyle Hunter Picks. Always great to chat with you, man. I know we, uh, we had to push this one a little bit quicker, but I still think we gave out a lot of great information and we'll do the same on next week's show and our shows going forward as well. Kyle, always a pleasure, man. Thank you so much for joining me and we'll talk to you again next week. All right. Look forward to it. Thanks, man. There you go. There's professional better and handicapper Kyle Hunter from huntersportspicks.com at Kyle Hunter Picks on Twitter. Coming up on our Thursday edition of ATS Radio, we'll chat with professional better and handicapper Brad Powers from bradpowersports.com. More college football game breakdowns. We'll talk some NFL as well. And then Friday, my picks for week 11 in the Circus Sports Million 2. That'll do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And I will talk to you again tomorrow.